Dr. Brandon lives here in California in Lake Arrowhead, and he is uh, currently practicing psychology in his own private practice in Los Angeles. I am pleased to give you the man you've all been anxiously awaiting and looking forward to, Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. Thank you. One would think that after so many years of lecturing on man-woman relationships and romantic love and having written three different books on the subject, I would no longer be intimidated at the prospect of trying in the brief space of 40 minutes to say something interesting about the obstacles to success in man-woman relationships. But nonetheless, the very enormity of the subject in the context of the brevity of the time that we have together continues a little bit to psych me out. Because the choice of what one might say is so overwhelming that uh, whatever I might choose to light on, driving home, I know I will be saying to my wife, oh my God, why didn't I talk about X, Y, and Z? Having given myself the satisfaction of feeling the remorse in advance of the talk, <laughs> I am now free to enjoy the balance of the program. I don't know, let me begin at an odd angle. I don't know that I would have felt quite so passionately about the need to write so much on this subject and to think so much about this subject if I didn't grow up in a home with parents uh, who generated an, an atmosphere that took unhappiness as the most natural way of life. <laughs> uh, when you are both Russian and Jewish, that somehow comes very naturally. And although my Catholic clients assure me you don't have to be either for it to come naturally to you, in any event, I remember that as a boy growing up, one of the things that struck me was that just about everybody in all the family, not just the, everybody, relatives in all directions of whom there were large quantities, was unhappy. And so who's happy was a sentence that I heard rather a lot. And it really struck me as wrong, as insane. It never made any sense to me that people should be as unhappy as they obviously were, and for that matter are. It never made any sense to me that most marriages should be as so frustrating and boring as they so generally seem to be, at least to my teenage eyes, confirmed by my 30, 40, and 50-year-old eyes. And so for a very long time, I found myself intensely interested in the problem of why it was that an enterprise that is so often begun with such goodwill and such passionately high hopes and such deeply felt yearnings toward another human being, so much affection, so much caring, should so often collapse into so much pain and bitterness. The failure rate of love as an enterprise far succeeds just about any other human endeavor that I can think of. If you rapidly, inside your mind, make a mental list of everybody that you know personally, who as best you can tell, not that we ever know inside somebody else's life, but as best you can tell, is reasonably successful or has a good deal to be happy about relative to his or her career. And then you make a second list of people who are married and about whom, as far as you can tell, they are pretty happy and successful as a married couple. I feel very safe in saying that the first list will be longer than the second. Or more to the point, the second will be shorter than the first. So I don't think that I need to persuade any one of you that uh, it's awfully hard to sustain 
happiness in romantic love. One of the things that shocked me when I was on promotional tour traveling around the country for the psychology of romantic love in 1980 and got interviewed a lot by newspaper interviewers and by radio and television people, a lot of whom, I guess this is more about me than about them, were surprisingly young, I was about to say. And I just realized that's a statement about me. Uh, they're probably the same age they always were, but I'm not. <laughs> Uh, I happen to be thinking of one time where I was sitting with a reporter from the uh, one of the LA papers in a restaurant. She was interviewing me in the book, and I was thinking, gosh, how young she is. And she was 28. Well, there was a time 10 minutes ago when 28 was an older woman, after all. <laughs> anyway, the thing that, that struck me in these interviews was the terrific amount of fear associated with the subject of romantic love. In other words, they kept saying, well, but like Dr. Brandon, like suppose it doesn't last, you know. I saw what happens to my parents' marriage. I saw how many, like how many divorces. Look what's happening to the divorce rate. And they, they were kind of reassured, I felt, by the fact that here was a, a gray-haired man talking with enthusiasm about romantic love. But they were also a little bit in awe. And I was struck by the amount of fear. And while I would imagine that people have always approached love with fear, it's hardly a phenomenon of the last decade or two, I don't doubt that the escalating divorce rate, the rapidity of every kind of change, and the general dissolution of the culture in so many ways probably contributes to an overall sense of the instability and the unreliability of everything. I think that many people when they marry, they marry with the idea that in a world of change, in a world of the unpredictable, in a world of the untrustworthy, I will have one rock to stand on, one sanctuary of safety called my home. It's pretty hard to have that kind of confidence getting married in 1984 if you're in any kind of contact with what's happening in the world. And yet, the requirements for success at love have not changed, so far as I can see, in any essential way since the beginning of love. The pressures change, the social context changes, but there are some fundamentals that seem to persist, and I want to talk briefly about what I think they are. Only a few, because there are many, and that's what makes this issue hard to touch upon briefly. The two subjects that have preoccupied me through all of my professional life have been self-esteem and romantic love as my two chief interests as a psychologist. And they're very intimately connected because they both have to do with love. And some of you have read me say that the first love affair that we need to consummate successfully in this world is with ourselves, because until we have done that, it's awfully difficult to sustain successful love with another person. But not just for the reason that you so often hear. Not just as you so often hear because if you don't love yourself, it's hard to love another person. That's true, of course. It's incomplete. As a psychotherapist, I'm much more struck by the other half, namely, the terrible un misfortunes and calamities that happen in relationships from people's fundamental doubt of their own lovability, their anticipation of rejection, their internal sense that no one who really gets to know them is going to go on loving them, their sense that it can't last, so that I can't think of any greater single downfall of love than a lack of an adequate self-esteem and self-confidence on the part of the participants needed to sustain it. Let's think about what we do when we are in a love relationship but we don't really feel lovable. To begin with, some of us immediately disparage the person who loves us because what is wrong with this person? 
their standards are so low or else they're so dense that they have fallen in love for somebody like me. See, if I know I am not lovable, I have to somehow make reality fit my knowledge. So I may start out perceiving you as unavailable or unattainable or not yet mine, in which case I can desire you and think you're fantastic. But if you fall in love with me, it makes me very happy, but it also makes me wrong about a fundamental issue of life. And one of the interesting things about the human beings as a species is we'd much rather be right than happy. <laughs> this is one of our most extraordinary characteristics. Uh, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, there was, it was said about the Germans that if they came to a, a crossroad and, and one road sign said to heaven and the other said to lectures on heaven, the, <laughs> the, the Germans would always go to the lectures. Well, not wanting to support ethnic jokes, I'll now tell you a species joke. If humans come to a cross in the road and one side says to happiness, but the other side says to to uh, misery combined with a sense of rectitude, they'll always opt for the second. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Anyway, so what do I do if I don't put you down for loving me? And people do that. I want her only so long as I can't have her. As soon as I get her, she loses esteem in my eyes, or he does. You all know that problem. But there's another pattern the problem of self-sabotage can take. If there's a voice inside saying something is wrong, this is not my story, then I will find ways to make reality conform. I will sabotage. I will pick a quarrel, get irrationally jealous, become hypercritical, become mysteriously remote or depressed. Because the truth of the matter is that if I don't feel it's fitting for me to be loved, when I'm loved, my anxiety goes up. Because I'm, I'm out of step with what I think reality is, and that will make anybody scared. If I'm playing Russian roulette with the facts of reality, that's nerve-wracking. And so I do something very natural. When we're, when we're anxious, we all do something very human. We'd like to reduce our anxiety. And if, and, if, and, if, and if creating trouble between us will reduce my anxiety, so be it. None of this occurs, happens consciously. But I've seen any number of perfectly good relationships sabotaged because I'm afraid. So fear of love, fear that it won't last, fear that you won't find me lovable, causes me to behave in ways that turns my fear into a self-fulfilling prophecy. See, the, you can't understand human beings if you don't understand the extent to which our lives are operated by the dynamic of self-fulfilling prophecies. If I open a store and in my heart I feel Nobody's going to want the product I've got to offer. I can't possibly make a profit in this line of work. And you come in to buy from me, and as you're walking toward me, there's a voice inside saying, nobody can want the products you've got to offer. You can't possibly make money in this line of work. Do you have any doubt that that's going to affect the way I say, hello, sir, or hello, madam, or the emotional atmosphere I create? or the spirit I create, or the likelihood that you'll buy or not buy from me. I remember when I was a kid in Toronto, one summer I did something I can no longer believe I did. I spent the summer selling magazine subscriptions. <laughs> or rather, I spent the summer not selling magazine <laughs> subscriptions. I wasn't especially talented for it, but I do remember one thing that the guy taught all us high school kids. The classic air, that much I got. He said, you never, never, when the lady opens the door, say something like, hello, madam, you wouldn't like to buy a subscription to the Saturday Evening Post, would you? Of course, it's very easy for her to say, you're right, son, I wouldn't. Well, translate that to, you know, you wouldn't like to kiss me, would you? You wouldn't like to go on a date with me, would you? You wouldn't like to marry me, would you? You're right. <laughs> On the other hand, there are people whom we sometimes call charming or very appealing or very likable because they obviously enjoy themselves and they like themselves and they kind of project it's very natural that you'll like them. I mean, why wouldn't you like them? They're a likable person. And you almost find yourself smiling irresistibly. And 
because they, the door is open. The door is open by the fact that I don't mean that they're arrogant or boastful, but they have a kind of a natural, non-boastful feeling of their own value and the natural benevolent confidence that you're going to be able to see it. And generally speaking, you do. I don't mean that you always fall in love, but the, the, the odds change now in the favor of such a person. So, of course, this leads to the immediate problem, well, what can I do if, suppose this is all true, Nathaniel, but what might I do practically? And I find that quite marvelous things can be accomplished relatively simply. If you really make up your mind, once you come to understand that you have a disposition to behave in self-destructive ways, there's an awful lot you can do by raising the level of your consciousness in a fairly mechanical way. I'm not long on willpower, perhaps because I don't have much. So I don't like asking that of clients of mine, you know, to do things by great acts of will, because I rarely do things by great acts of will. Uh, but I do like to find it, look for ways to make it as easy as possible for myself to do the things that I would like to do. Um, well, so I will often encourage a client to make lists of my favorite five or ten strategies for sabotaging relationships. Like a client comes in and says, oh, I've just met this terrific man. I've met this terrific woman, but I know my track record. I'm going to do it again. So after you work through the dynamics, we get into, okay, how, where, how, where does this self-destructive impulse find come from? And, you know, you can get into the reason. The history is interesting. Most of us experienced a lot of rejection as children. Most of us often didn't feel all that loved by our parents. Uh, maybe a, br a brother was preferred, a sister was preferred, or, a dad was, or dad's bottle was preferred, whatever the case may be. I mean, we all are graduates of one kind of rejection or another. Mother ran off with another man when we were five years old. And, and we feel abandoned, and we have a destiny that all women will abandon us, or all men will abandon us. We, I mean, that we all understand. But, and I don't say there's no value in understanding that, but it doesn't yet tell us what to do in the present. The value in understanding it is that it only helps us to understand that we're now operating out of old routines that don't really bear upon the present tense reality of our life unless we choose to allow them to bear on the present tense reality of our life. So let's assume that a person has got a fairly decent level of understanding about why he or she is so predisposed to feel unlovable or to anticipate that rejection or to fear sustained intimacy. But he or she says, now, what might I do? Well, one of the things that I find most useful, I like charts. And by that I mean I like to know the list of what are your favorite self-sabotaging devices. And the interesting thing is, and if you don't, and if you, and if you start to make a list and you get stuck, I always say, ask your partner. The partner will help you. <laughs> I want you to make a list of maybe five or ten or fifteen of the things you most typically do to obstruct you and your partner being happy together. And generally speaking, if they are married, I ask them after you've done your best list, show it to your spouse, get his or her input. So let's really. It may take two or three weeks to get a really high class list. Okay. Then we talk about, for each of those items, what the person imagines they might like to do instead in that kind of situation. And we talk about that a little bit. Until I know that they've got some clear concept of alternatives. Because we don't give up doing something just because we know it's bad or self-destructive if we have no concept of what, what, what we could do instead. Generally speaking, if something doesn't work, we do it again but with more frenzy. I know that therapists do that. <laughs> so we don't abandon a behavior if we don't have any idea of what behavior we could substitute for it. Now comes the fun part. The fun part is how to get change happening without agony. And a lot of change can happen without agony. And I, I'm very partial to lists. And by the way, I've used this with a, a parent who wants to clean up his or her behavior with a child. I'm just using a, the man-woman relationship because that's what I'm talking about today. But the principle could apply to you on your job, you with a child, you with a friend, okay? 
I say now you make a list, a, a, a picture, if you will, a chart. And on the left side, you, you got an, each, each of these items. And then you have the day broken up, draw a nice chart, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And you put this on the mirror where you shave or you make up. And then I say, now, I don't want you to change or improve or clean up your act. All I want you to do is to make a tick each day, every time you execute one of these behaviors that you have labeled as self-destructive or self-sabotaging. You're not asking me to change or improve, doctor? No. Absolutely not. I hate it when people ask me to reform. All I want you to do is make a tick. Of course, what happens? Immediately, if you can really get the person committed to do the exercise, the self-destructive behavior begins to diminish. Because what you have done is really used a kind of a, a, a technique to interrupt automaticity. Once somewhere in my brain, I know that before I go to bed, I've got to make my entries. My doctor may not have told me, be more conscious in the daytime. But there is no other way to carry out his instruction or her instruction except to be more conscious in the daytime, do you see? And in that way, through a fairly simple mechanical device, we actually maneuver ourselves into being far more conscious of what we are doing. And if we do this over two or three weeks, we notice something. That when we forego the self-destructive behavior in favor of behavior that, self, that is self-serving, two delightful discoveries are made. And the chief reason you need a therapist is like a therapist is like a coach. My favorite metaphor for what a therapist is in my world is a coach. If you can just have somebody to keep monitoring and watching over for a while, two, two things happen after a few weeks, typically. A, you find that you like what happens in your life more when you don't do these self-destructive behaviors. And the second thing you find out is that you don't die. <laughs> and that is a very exciting piece of news. Because many people feel and this also pertains to self-esteem, that they don't really feel entitled to be happy. Uh, we may have got messages that you don't deserve to be happy, or we may be raised in a religious home where it's a sin to be happy, or if you're enjoying yourself, you can be sure you're on tr in trouble, kid. Anybody who's having a good time is for sure sinning. Now, my clients tell me that, for example, nuns are really good at teaching this, but I think others beside nuns are very good at teaching this, all right? So if I feel that I'm not worthy of happiness or I'm not deserving to be happy or a mother would be so hurt and abandoned if she would feel that I'd be more happy in my marriage than she was in hers, that's a real problem for a lot of daughters. How would mother feel if she saw me making more of a success than I made of hers? Mother would be hurt and mother would appreciate me. However it happens, we're not concerned with the ultimate causes at the moment, all that I care about for the moment is there's a voice inside saying it's not appropriate for me to be happy. But consciously, I want to be happy. But when somebody comes to me and they tell me I'm unhappy, one of the very first things I want to know is deep inside, is it okay for you to be happy? And you'd be very surprised, perhaps, to know how many people feel it is not okay. I want it. They're not lying. I want it. But there's a voice saying it's not okay. There is a lack of internal permission. So what's the good of teaching you better ways to communicate, important though that is, or 14 new sexual positions, interesting and enlightening though that may be? What's the way of teaching new ways to be happy if we don't at some point deal with a voice saying it's not appropriate or okay for you to be happy? Happiness is not your destiny. Now, you may find that hard to believe or not. I don't know. But since I cannot talk about everything in the world that I would like to say on this subject, I want to tell you that I personally believe that if most people, if so many people rather, 
did not regard unhappiness as so normal, they would fight harder to make their relationships work. They wouldn't allow months and months of silence and frustration, and they wouldn't lay down and live with misery and frustration. If unhappiness didn't feel so damned normal, so damned familiar, so damned comfortable, I observe a lot of heads nodding. I guess I feel understood. I think that one of the biggest things that separates people psychologically is whether or not unhappiness predominantly feels to you normal or un abnormal. For example, typically if most of us, and I guess all of us, wake up in the morning with the cold or the flu or we're otherwise feeling ill, if it's illness we regard that as an exception. We don't say, I've got a headache, I'm sneezing, my nose is running, my joints are aching, so who's healthy? <laughs> we say, gee, I think I've got the flu. We regard it as a temporary condition. We figure out what we can do, and we expect that in a few days we'll feel better. Because most or all of us in this room regard healthiness as normal and unhealthiness as an aberration. Not a crime, but an exception to the normal run of things and a, some, a state to be dealt with and gotten over. It's not a crime to have cold or to have the flu or to break an arm. But if you are out skiing and you break your arm, nobody says, so who's got a comfortable arm that can move? But now, your partner has shown no interest in sex with you for the past year. <laughs> your partner's sole communication is to inquire what is for dinner. And you say, every marriage has its problems. Can I be certain my next mate would treat me any better? <laughs> See, there are two funny things about people. I don't know which is more unfortunate. One, they give up too soon. And the other is they hang on too long. <laughs> on the one hand, there are people who, in a relationship when there are difficulties they're gone I'm supposed to have fun but can't have fun who wants to be here they have no concept of working on a relationship of trying to communicate and get to the root of what's wrong and see how we might fix it that's one error is not having like a child's notion that if it doesn't happen spontaneously and automatically forget it now that's the view that's given romantic love a bad name because that view is sometimes identified with romantic love, and of course that to me is nonsense. That's why I wrote romantic love is for grown-ups, it's not for children. That's truly a child's notion of love. Nothing in this world just happens. Nothing, including love. We all know about our work. That you don't just say, well, I love my work, what else is there to say? Now I'll let the profits roll in. <laughs> you also have to show up at the office, don't I? <laughs> And about work, don't I know that no matter how much I love my work, there are days when I don't wake up and I don't want to go to bed, I don't want to go to the office. I don't say typically, I'm going to quit psychology or I'm going to quit law or I'm going to quit business. I say, I'm not in the mood to work today for some reason. But people go into a panic when they have the same range of totally normal relationships about a lover or a spouse, the assumption that there is you get into one fixed ideal groove, and if you ever leave it, it's calamity. In other words, there's no psychological realism about the natural up and down in the emotional pattern of our life in love just as there is in work. You can be insane about your work, you can love the work, and there can be days when you don't want to go to your office. Uh, you can be insane about your partner, and there can be days when you really want to be alone. It doesn't mean you don't love your partner. But a lot of people don't understand that, so they interpret any kind of trouble as calamity, and they respond with tragedy or with flight. But the other error, both errors, by the way, sound opposite, but they have one thing in common. The bottom line is the same. It's spelled misery, it's spelled frustration. The other error is no sense that a lifetime of pain is not normal. The loss of all recognition of the fact that pain always signals trouble. Now, the trouble doesn't have to be lethal. 
it doesn't have to be the end of the universe, but they have no sense that pain means something needs to be dealt with. A lot of people have, and especially intellectually inclined people, and especially men, I think men more than women, though I'm not, no, I take that back, not men more than women, people. A lot of men have, a, a lot of people have a very, <laughs> that was definitely a slip. Because I, I just recently saw this dramatically manifested in a man, but I can immediately think of equally, equal examples from women. But the last one that hit my consciousness was male, and it's influenced me. Anyway, a lot of men have a very funny notion of strength. I am strong. I can endure anything. I can endure a wife that, sat, that ridicules me. I can endure a partner that doesn't treat me with respect. I can endure going without sex but once in four years. I'm just about the strongest, most manly character you've ever met. So I say sometimes we measure strength by what we can endure and sometimes we measure strength by what we refuse to endure. Because if we only measure strength by what we can endure, are we kidding ourselves? You know, we have done, we have glamorized a trait for which the proper name is passivity. See, passivity, you want to dress it up and glamorize it, you call it endurance. Endurance, do you know what endurance is a great virtue? When you have to do something and you have no choice and it hurts but it's necessary. Then, virtue has, then endurance has survival value. Endurance, when it has no survival value, is anti-survival. Because it means you are continuing to put up with something that is bad for you. But observe that whether you keep changing partners every 10 minutes because you don't know how to work on a relationship and don't care to learn, or you put up with an impossible relationship for 50 years because you're so heroically strong, the bottom line is you never find out what happiness and love would mean for more than 10 minutes. Now, I suppose that one of the most important things that people don't understand about love is how much consciousness love requires. We understand it about work. The world is full of people who they walk into their office. You know, an office has an almost a kind of a soul. You walk into an office, and have you ever had this experience? I know I can walk in my office, maybe there'll be three, four, or five people there. I can't even fully explain how you do it, but I know the mood in the office within two minutes. If a machine is not working right, somewhere inside I know something is wrong. You sense with, you, with your business very often the most exquisite kind of awareness. Your accountant tells you something when you're running down the hall. Wait a minute. Ten minutes later, something's clicking in your brain. Those figures don't sound right. You go back and you say, hey, George, check that again. Did you forget about X? Uh, oh, gee, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, I forgot. How did you know? Because it's your business, and you care about it, and you cultivate a kind of super consciousness of what's going on. Now, you could take, uh, let us say, a, a businessman who has this in his work, and you say, tell me something. What was your wife's emotional mood when you left the office this morning? I don't know. What were your kids talking about at breakfast when you were all together? Why ask me? When was the last time you spent time alone talking to your wife? I don't know. Or you ask a wife, tell me something. Is your husband fully contented in his work? I don't know. What does he dream about? I don't know. When was the last time that table was dusted? Thursday at 3.45. <laughs> Do 
The hard thing about explaining this issue is because it sounds so very abstract, living consciously. I think that we approach the problem of romantic love all wrong if we start with the questions, why do so many relationships fail? I think the interesting question is, why do some succeed? Because if you consider how most of us were raised, how most of us were brought up, how few of us had decent role models in terms of our father or mothers, how inadequately we were prepared or educated for love as adults, it seems to me that the great miracle is that some people, through their own independence or their own perseverance or their own creativity, make it. And I'm among those psychologists who believe that we can learn more by studying success than by studying failure. And one of the things that Devers and I tried to communicate in the book we wrote together, the Romantic Love Question and Answer book, is some of the things that we and other psychologists have found out about what are the elements that make relationships successful, rather than why do so many fail. Um, I think that's something worth meditating on. Um, I suddenly find myself thinking of two colleagues I know, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, both psychologists, both psychotherapists, both married, uh, both who in different ways have, uh, from occasion to occasion, given me, a, I wouldn't say give me a bad time, but been a little, uh, taken some pokes at me on uh, my uh, advocacy of the, the kind of romantic love that I write about and that I advocate. And what's interesting to me is that in both cases, these are guys with an incredible history of uh, extramarital adventures with wives who are filled with undealt with rage. Who assiduously avoid talking about the great issues of their relationship in both cases, which I know to my certain knowledge. But who occasionally, in letters or in person, attempt to give me lectures on my failure to understand that what love is really about is uh, conjugal affection and uh, not looking too critically at the other person's shortcomings. A position which I can well understand their desire to, uh, uh, to uh, spread, shall we say. I don't mean that nobody should talk about these subjects who is not perfectly realized, but uh, because all of us have faults, all of us make mistakes, all of us at times don't act from our best knowledge. I know I don't. But I think that we have to have had some experience of high-level happiness over some period of time to be able to talk intelligently about what this particular situation requires. Now, I want to do a small exercise before concluding. If you'd be willing to, you can do it from where you are, because it just illuminates one other aspect of the situation. And if you'd be willing, you can do it in your seats. It's pretty simple. It's pretty easy. It's a little fantasy that might illuminate one other problem that, in my experience, seems relevant to people's difficulties. And uh, would you be kind enough to sit with your feet flat on the floor and close your eyes. And I only ask you to close your eyes so you can have a minimum of distractions and go inside. And what I want you to do is to imagine something. Now, you might not need to imagine it because for you it might be a reality. So much the better if it is. But whether it's a reality or something you're imagining, I want you to go inside and imagine that you are really feeling very fulfilled in the area of romantic love, that you're really feeling happily in love and very profoundly fulfilled in that area. You're really feeling fulfilled as a man or as a woman. Whatever it was you really wanted to have in that realm, you feel, I've got it. 
and take a moment to kind of enter into that state of imagining what that might be like. Now, it doesn't matter in real life whether your parents are living or not. For the purpose of this little fantasy, is let's assume they're alive. And what I want you to do is to see mother and father, or it could be a step-parent, but whoever functions as mother or father, kind of standing by, and they're witnessing your romantic happiness. They are somehow seeing you in a state of incredible happiness and fulfillment in love. And if you pay very careful attention to the looks and the expressions on their faces, you'll probably notice they're feeling a lot of things, not a simple emotional reaction, but a compound or a complex emotional response. I'd like you to just, keeping your eyes closed for a reason that's important, which I'll tell you in a minute, try to notice what are the messages coming off of their face to you. Take a moment to put it into words. And with your eyes tightly closed, that's very important for this next step, with your eyes tightly closed, I want to ask you a question. If you imagine that you are getting something that you would call a negative message from at least one parent, would you raise your hand to the ceiling? High up to the ceiling. High, high up. High up. Touch the ceiling with your hand. And now open your eyes and look around with your hand high up. Welcome to the human race. Now, the second half of the exercise. No, we'll stop here. The second half has to do with work. But since I'm just talking about love, we'll skip work. But I will just tell you, I have done this exercise. I can't tell you with how many thousands of people I've done it at university audiences. I love to do this exercise. It's great favorite research for me with many, many thousands of people. And I'll tell you something. The whole exercise goes like this. If I ask the group, how many people think you're getting negative messages from at least one parent, unfailingly, roughly 85% of the hands in the room go up. If I say from both parents, it's around 65%. Now think about the implications of that. Does that mean that most of our parents told us when we were little, I don't want you ever to be happily married? Of course not. And yet somehow we have pictures of mother saying, are you sure you have made a mistake? Or of mother or father looking hurt and betrayed and abandoned, how could you do this to me? Or a father feeling jealous? Or a mother saying, are you sure she's good enough for you? Or are you sure this person really loves you? Or a look that says it won't last, it won't last, right? Now, what I want to put in your mind is this idea. Parents don't act out of malevolence. They just have their own struggles. They're just doing their own thing, but they, they create a certain kind of home life. Like my mother loved to tell me, nobody will ever love you like your mother. Thank God I didn't believe her. <laughs> I'm happy to say I've done much better since. <laughs> uh, but suppose I had believed her. Suppose I had believed her. Don't trust any other woman as much as your mother. Or imagine a father saying, with no evil intention, you'll always be daddy's little girl. And you see daddy looking so happy. Being married and having orgasms would mean I'm no longer daddy's little girl. Daddy made me feel better than anybody else in the whole world. My whole sense of safety and security is tied up with daddy. But now I've got a conflict, see? I'm grown up. And I also got the message that I'm expected to be a grown up woman. How do I be a grown up woman and be forever daddy's little girl? How could I do that? Well, I could do it. In a, depending upon other variables, I've got a lot of choices. Of course, one way is to remain so immature and so childlike 
that I literally never grew up in an obvious way, and marry a stern authoritarian figure who will be a father substitute, but who I will always compare unfavorably to daddy. Or there's another way of remaining faithful to daddy, and that's called sleeping with everybody in sight. That's a very special way of always being faithful to daddy. Because if I sleep with everybody, I belong to nobody except you, daddy. And I'm always faithful to you in my fashion. Now, did daddy really have it in his mind to create these kind of problems when he said, you'll always be my little girl? He was just trying to stop time, probably. This was one of the happiest days of his life. He looked at her and thought, you'll never be five years old again. Life is so great. If only I could freeze this moment. I wouldn't have to die. You wouldn't have to grow up. This moment is so wonderful. There was nothing evil in his motive. The point is not to blame anybody. You understand me? But, but, but. Consequences, consequences, consequences. So, I have been a long time fascinated by the fact that in just about every one of the heroic myths or legends in just about every culture that I know about, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, every legend, every great myth that deals in any culture with the hero's journey seems always to have one common element. In fact, has many common elements. But do you know what one common element is? There's always the myth of the hero in every culture. It always involves leaving home, going out into the world, and it often or sometimes involves coming back and, and, and reconnecting with the family, but in an entirely new, different way with a new set of rules in a different context. Now, it's a magnificent metaphor because what is the dilemma for many of us? Many of us feel unconsciously a tension, a tension between, on the one hand, protecting our relationship with home, with the first big matrix, with family, with security, with mother and father, and evolving into fully who we are, which would include the possibility of an adult love relationship. So that there is consciously or less than consciously some feeling of a tension between really coming into my own as a man or a woman and really protecting that relationship with mother or father. So that in the happiest of households, we have to at a certain level say goodbye before we can say hello to our own positive potentialities as adult man or woman. And it's interesting how widespread is the intuitive understanding of the relationship between the thrust towards <laughs> self-actualization, individuation, and growth on the one hand, and the need to separate from home and, to, and perhaps most significantly from the mothering figure on the other hand, as, as the cost of fully realizing our human possibilities. And it's interesting to think that when you're out on a date or in a marriage, you are engaged in a kind of heroic journey, because that's not how you were ever taught to think about it. That is, to become fully who you are and to reach your own best pos possibilities against that incredible gravitational pull which says, the safety and protection and security of childhood, and all you have to give up is the adults, is happiness possible only to adults. I must tell you in conclusion, anybody who is happy over any period of time is admirable. It never happens by accident. Anybody who is happily married over any period of time is awesome. It never happens by accident. If you see anybody who is happily married, if you see a couple who've been happily married for any period of time, whatever, and I don't mean that they don't, they know everybody fights and everybody has frictions and every time, everybody sometimes uh, has misunderstandings and you yell. I'm talking about basic happiness, basic commitment, basic joy in the other person. Anybody who has sustained that over a period of time has really learned and mastered something really profound about what life is all about. 
It's got to be one of the most extraordinary of all human attainments evidenced by the failure rate. If you weigh the number of people who try it against the number of people who succeed, I said this would be my last point, but it has a postscript I can't help myself. I told you, on this subject, there's no such thing as drawing the line and saying, that's it, folks. I've got to say one more sentence. Our culture is not designed, the values of our culture are not designed to support romantic love. I'll give you an example of what I mean. I'm walking down the street, and I meet a friend, and he says, hi, Nathaniel, what you been doing? And I say, oh, what have I been doing? I've been working 16 hours a day at my word processor. I've just written uh, three new books in the last 10 minutes, you know, and, or whatever, you know. And I say, boy, that's great. I can't believe you. You're a regular productivity machine. That's fabulous. I don't know how you do it. I get terrific reinforcement, you know. But now I would say, imagine, what have you been doing, Nathaniel, for the last three weeks? Having fun with my wife. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> uh, but a lot of us know that one is actually, for some of us, easier than the other through no fault of the wife, but through our own bad habits and, 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 and maybe guilt when we're not working or whatever the case may be. Now, the culture is not geared to respect happiness in marriage. It's, it's geared to disrespect the failure of marriage. You're not supposed to get divorced. I mean, it's strong in its negative position, but it doesn't strongly support what an extraordinary attainment it is when people pour time and energy into making themselves and each other happy. So I think that one of the things that people know who are able to be happily married for a significant period of time, they know it's an achievement. They know it's an attainment. They know damn well they're doing something unusual. Nobody has to tell them it takes consciousness and perseverance. They know that. Since I'm very eager to have some time for questions, feedback, and interactions. I think I'll pause here and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, Linda? that is a primary or a very significant characteristic toward a favorable prognosis. And on the other side, do you see any downside risks to that? Um, that's really interesting. I would phrase it a little bit differently, and uh, you'll tell me whether we're talking about the same thing or not. Okay? Uh, I, as a writer, am obsessed with the nuances of words and their subtleties of meaning. So that if you said to me, in choosing a partner, is it supremely important to pick somebody that you not only love and desire, but also like and respect or admire, I would have, without missing a beat, said absolutely yes. If you said to me, is there a sense in which uh, your partner is your best friend, or you want your partner to be your best friend, I would again have said, of course, yes. I'm going to give you a highly subjective and highly personal answer. Allow me to answer you less as a psychologist than as a man. There is, for me personally, something undangerous in the concept of friendship. 
But I use dangerous in a poetic sense now, in a romantic sense now, in a positive sense now. In the person that I love, there is a certain kind of excitement, a certain kind of electrical charge that I associate with that kind of connection, which is much more than sexual, but which I don't associate with friendship. Now, that may be more a statement about me than about the subject matter. I'm not at all prepared to say that what I say right now has got any objective validity, whatever. I feel I'm answering you very subjectively. Uh, at times, I certainly have said to Devers, you're my very best friend in the whole world, and meant it. But I generally say it half smiling, like it's not quite the terms in which I ordinarily think when I'm thinking about love. And yet, you certainly would never want to feel that your partner is not your friend. There is a kind of, for me, risk in love because you maybe share more of yourself than in any other relationship. Maybe because you put more out onto the table than in any other relationship. More of who you are gets manifest. And that has for me the feeling of some exciting difference from close friendship which even if it's intimate close friendship always feels has a such a different feeling for me personally that I'm not certain whether this is all semantics and the personal connotations that words have for me or whether I'm really talking about anything worth talking about that's my honest answer <laughs> yes Devers very best friend and start out that way. Now that's not like the thing that we are best friends, but sometimes they end up like brother and sister. One of the first things that goes is the sexual excitement. So one of the things I would say, yes, you should be friends, everything Nathaniel said, but if it swings too much in that direction, invariably I have seen couples come in complaining that they adore each other, they love each other, they're like brother and sister, and, and the sex is gone from their relationship. Yeah. They're like, they're wonderful friends, but there's no sexual electricity. Yeah, I, I think Devers is probably reacting out of the same experiences that I've had uh, uh, working clinically, that perhaps we're, we've observed the same sets of observations that lead us to have these feelings. Um, that's the best answer I can give. I'm glad we agree. I was, <laughs> since, since, since we have never discussed this issue, I had no idea what you were going to say later. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I, I wanted to add, when you're talking about listing the, the, the self-destructive on, on the one side, and right. side that's very, that is very true to, to, to make yourself conscious. Like, I, I started a diet about nine months ago, and I did that. I listed the foods that I ate. And once I became consciously aware of the junk I was eating, I, I eventually now, through a process of time, that's wonderful. eliminated it all. That's right. That's exactly the why so often people who are diets are advised to make lists. It's just a technique to raise consciousness. Is that, is that included in your romantic love question and answer book? Is that I know that we tell in there I, one I, or two stories where we, you know, having told so many clinical stories and so many books, my head swims. Right now I no longer can remember. The two books in which we tell the most stories are The Romantic Love Question and Answer Book and my book Honoring the Self. At times my head swims trying to remember in which book I said what, but it gives me an excuse to urge you, of course, to read both. <laughs> if only in the interest of literacy. <laughs> what else? Yes? During uh, your years of psychology, uh, I could, I'm going to try and tie this into political standpoint. Okay. And the concept of happiness. I'm not sure I'll be able to do this very well, but I have an intrinsic uh, observation in the bureaucratic, uh, in, in the bureaucracies of all countries, that there tends to be a growth of unhappiness in these kinds of situations. I, I'm a tax practitioner myself, and I deal with many of the bureaucrats uh, on a face-to-face -face basis. Uh -huh. 
And in seeing that, I, I guess what I'm tending to asking you, is there some mechanism that we can use as individuals, uh, or that we as a society can do to train a happiness syndrome that I feel would ultimately kind of pull away from the, in my sense, the bludgeoning of the bureaucracy, the growth of the, of the uh, uh, desire to make these great empires as opposed to deal with people. This kind of, well, you know what I'm tempted to respond by saying first? I've thought of writing more on the subject of happiness and happiness anxiety in the future. And some of you know what an ungodly battle it is to try to redeem into a legitimate positive meaning the concept of selfishness. I have a feeling that if one ever tried to deal with happiness in a serious positive philosophical way, one would end up drawing almost as much wrath down on one's head. Uh, even though many more people give lip service to happiness than do any legitimate notion of selfishness. But it is true that one of the things that makes people put up with every kind of unhappiness, including taxes, is uh, too ready acceptance of suffering as inevitable. I don't know how much time I've got, but we assume somebody will tell me. I don't know when it's to stop. Uh, I think we should probably uh, plan on taking another 15 minutes. If You're the boss. Whatever. Yes. Back row. Um, you were talking earlier in the lecture about sabotage part of the relationship. Uh -huh. Later on, you were talking about electricity right. and talking about becoming my brother and sister. That seems largely a function of time. I mean, uh, two people living together day after day and the habits. Okay. It seems that, that that alone would cause a certain amount of, of attrition and excitement. How exciting can it be to keep coming home to the same person night after night after night? <laughs> well, as a man who grew up with three sisters, I feel I have something worthwhile to say on this subject. On the most difficult day of a marriage, I have never been able to experience a wife in a sisterly way. <laughs> uh, for me, it is a relationship so radically different. She, let me explain to you something. Uh, again, you know, I am very aware of the fact that there is no way to talk that I'm aware of impartially on this subject. You start talking about the subject, you're telling the person about your private life. Either as it really is or you want them to think it is. But the point is, there is no way just to, you know, be, quote, objective, unquote. And by that, I'm trying to get across to you is this idea. Uh, if somebody would tell me that, that would mean that they, no they had lost the sense of experiencing the mate. In any, in any meaningful sense as a sexual being. Because at no time did I ever experience my sisters as sexual beings, meaning intellectually or cognitively I knew they must be, but it had absolutely no reality for me as a man. Right? I, now, that doesn't mean that you're always equally sexually turned on to your partner. But in any love relationship, which is a true love relationship, whether, whether you're in the mood for sex or not, whether you're mad at your partner or not, there's a kind of a primary awareness of them in a sexual way which radically separates it from brother or sister. And that, I think, is true on the most sexless day of the marriage. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's got nothing to do with are you in the mood for sex right now. It's got nothing to do with whether you're angry at your partner right now. It's the fact that your way of experiencing your partner so intrinsically carries that as an essential component that isn't that nobody would ever agree with your description, but I would say that's an issue of our individual stories rather than of the nature of marriage. Do you see? So somebody could say, yeah, after X years of marriage, my husband felt more like a brother than he did like a husband. But I would not say, well, of course, what do you think? That's marriage. I would say, well, that's too bad. That's the story of this relationship. Yes, George. Nathan, do you think it's uh, 
valid, I'm not sure that's the right word, but to say that if you're in a relationship with a person you consider extraordinary as an individual, quite apart from your relationship with them, and if you would think that perhaps the relationship you have, for whatever reason, will never be more than, say, 50% of what it might be, but that, say, 50% with a person like that is more exciting and interesting than, say, 100% with anyone else you might find. Do you think that's a, that's a strange way of stating it, but do you understand what I'm saying? There are certain types of people, I and mean, they're associated with artists or uh, that type of mentality sometimes, that are very, say, eccentric by ordinary standards. And it may be that they're never going to be uh, amenable to a normal sort of relationship in some ways. And yet they're very interesting people, and there might be a lot of excitement and a lot of turmoil living in the Okay, I, I think the question is a really interesting one, as a matter of fact. Um, and I think that within limits, there are legitimate differences among people. See, one person could say, well, like, I am in a romance with X, and X has got these characteristics and these characteristics, but he, she is so exciting, is so interesting, when we are together, it is so fantastic, I can live with the trade-off. And somebody else can say, I can't. I know what I want in a marriage. I'd love to have it with X, but the frustrations are just too painful for me. Well, I don't think you or I looking on could legitimately say one of them is right and one of them is wrong, they're each making a statement about who they are and what their values are, and that I, from the outside, unless you saw this wonderful charismatic figure really, you know, treating the person appallingly, you know, with no respect, no nothing, then you might say, hey, this is really untenable. But assuming there was some really decent level of gratification and fulfillment in the relationship, I think that's an issue of your individual personality and individual values, how much? But, see, you know why the question is very interesting? Here is something, let me speak from a man's point of view. I have had many female clients say that raise this problem in therapy. The, the men who treat them the best are almost never the men they admire the most. Because the men they admire the most tend to be much more work-oriented, much more achievement-oriented, uh, much more moving through life at 90 miles an hour, and therefore not always as sensitive as the more laid-back, easy-going, less ambitious kind of boyfriend who is generally more sensitive to their moods, more caring, more nurturing, more affectionate. And that many a woman has come in and said, boy, you know, this is, I got a guy who is wonderful in every way except, you know, he's... Uh, he, he's a lifeguard. I've never had better sex. I've never been treated better. Uh, I, he's kind. He knows my moods like nobody has ever known them. He's the first man who listens when I talk to him. We all know what that means, right? But Nathaniel, what am I going to do? He's a lifeguard. She's a lawyer. She says, Nathaniel, now I've dated a lot of high-powered lawyers. I would never want to marry one. But there's some of them that I really admire. So that's one way to, to focus why. So what do we ask of life, I think? All of us have to know, A, what we want, and B, what we will reasonably settle for. And I mean settle for not in the irrational sense of resignation to Zolcho, but I mean a settle for in a reasonable way. Like, for example, if you want to sell your house, you can say, well, I'd like to get 400000 but I'll say yes to three eighty. I won't say yes to forty. You understand? I mean, well, you know, so when I say settle for, I mean it in a reasonable sense. Uh, we can say... Um, I want a, what would I like? I would like a wife who would always be interested whenever I'm in the mood to air my thoughts about the cosmos. <laughs> but I would happily, I could live happily with a woman who would be interested enough of the time that I would feel I had a true companion for my journey even if she persisted in the delusion that she did have a life of her own. <laughs> so, so it's always an issue. 
it's always an issue, is it not, of saying, what do I want? Is it reasonable? What would I settle for? Would what I say I would settle for be harmful to me? And finding that level. That's why it doesn't lend itself to kind of a, yeah, well, like, yes or no answer. I hope this is a value. This is how I would think about that question. Yes? Well, there is no simple answer because obviously the first thing that you don't need me to tell you to do is to say, look, partner, uh, here are some things you are doing that are hurting me or upsetting me and I need for us to talk about. So uh, the difficulty with questions of this form is that it always takes this pattern. They're almost, it almost always goes like this. Somebody will say, what do I do if my partner won't discuss our relationship? Then I will say, well, you might say so-and-so. And the next line is, but suppose I say so-and-so and he still won't discuss our relationship. Then I might say, well, then you might do so-and-so. And then the answer comes back, but suppose I do so-and-so and he still won't talk about our relationship. And this dance continues. So all you can do is say, talk about what's troubling you. Tell her, him rather what you are doing. Ask the person, are you willing to talk about what you think your role is in our unhappiness? Are you willing to match me? Show the person what you're doing. Now the person says, no, I won't talk about it or I won't match you. I won't acknowledge that I'm doing anything to make life difficult. I don't know any easy answer to that one. This has got to be the most complex subject in the world. One more question. One more question. Yes. What do you think about the institution of marriage? You know, at some point in a relationship with, uh, with somebody making the, the commitment verbal to everybody in the world that you're going to spend the rest of your life with this person. Do you think that, it's, that it is a, that is an option that's beneficial or appropriate or perhaps I can't say it but no you've said it's fine marriage we as a species humankind has always had rituals formal actions through which we express events of importance like, you know, if somebody dies, you know, we don't just say, would somebody phone up and say, please, well, you know, cart the body away. There's a funeral, there is something. If, if there is a, 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 a birthday or some event of importance, we, uh, we look for some actions that would give some objective expression, stop, this is important. We look to make some kind of what I would call socially objective statement to mark certain events as significant. Now, if two people fall in love, they can dedicate themselves to each other and to the relationship without the formality of getting married, true enough. But since the beginning of society, most people have always opted to be married. And although there are many reasons psychologically why they do so, I think that part of the reason lies in the fact that we have a desire for what I call social objectification whenever it fits, meaning the desire to give some kind of social expression to the fact this is my mate whoever harms her harms me we are we are in many important respects hereafter to be treated as one unit there's a very complex public statement in saying she and i he and i are married or i wish to marry him or i wish to marry her it's a very complex social communication it's obviously a communication to the individual, but it's, it's also a social communication. In other words, I don't think that if two people 
were living alone on a desert island, if it were possible, they would be likely to get married. I think it's, it's definitely something which has a social significance. It's a way of defining ourselves relative to the wider world. It says, I place this person above all others, and it also says, don't any of you ever put me in a position where I will be expected to place something above her or him. So it's a very complex communication involved in getting married. Um, do I think that everybody who is in love and who would like to spend their life together, quote, should, unquote, get married? Of course not. I think marriage is something that you shouldn't do unless you really want to do it. Okay, I was coming to that. That's my very last point. Do you know that if I were writing the marriage vows or whatever, do you know the only formula that I know of that is truthful? As far as I am able to see into the future, you are it. As far as I am able to see, I am committed to spending my life with you. That is the honest thing that a human being can say. And the nice thing about anniversaries is that each year you can say, and it's still true that as far as I can see, <laughs> you know, the first year comes around, maybe he says, uh, how's your eyesight, honey? Can you see any farther now? <laughs> so uh, one reason why, you know, we celebrate anniversaries or we go out with our partner, we say, I love you 10 times more than the day we got married. It's just ways of saying still, nothing has changed. As far as I can see into the future, you are it. The reason why I like that formulation is because people, often young people say, well, how can anybody say, I know that I'm going to want to stay with you for the rest of my life? And the truth is, there's an obvious sense in which you can't say it with absolute certainty. You can say that by the best of my knowledge, within everything known to me now, and as far as I can see, this is the true statement of my feelings. Maybe, maybe it should read until and unless life do us part. Listen, uh, thank you. I've really enjoyed being with you and talking with you. <laughs>